Good evening. In this program, we are going to talk about planets of other stars. But first of all, Chris and I have some news notes, beginning with a rather sad one. The Genesis probe spent two years in space collecting particles from the solar wind. The idea was bring it into the atmosphere, collect it by helicopter, and lower it gently down. Sadly, that didn't happen. The parachutes failed, and it hit the Utah desert at about 200 mph, which did it no good at all. However, it does seem something may be salvaged. On the other hand, better news from Mars, Chris. That's right, and the Mars Express spacecraft has been looking at the distribution of methane around the planet, and in three particular areas, the methane seems to be associated with regions where we think there are frozen water just under the planet's surface. And this supports the idea that the methane might be associated with either geothermic, volcanic activity, or even life. And these, these are results which really begin to indicate that we're developing an understanding of the detail of how the Martian system works. I wonder, because much further out in our solar system, Saturn. The Cassini probe is now in the Saturnian system. And there have been two discoveries recently. First of all, a very faint new ring near the little satellite Atlas. That wasn't seen before. And possibly two more moons moving around between the orbits of Mimas and Enceladus. They're both very small, less than 10 miles across, but they are there. The total count of Saturnian moons is now over 30. And it just goes to show how complicated the ring system is. It seems such a simple structure when you see it in the telescope, but it's got an awful lot of detail and an awful lot of objects make it up. Now, I'm just over right away from the solar system. Yes, 95% of the way to the Big Bang itself and the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, oh, yeah. the faintest galaxies ever recorded. And in particular, astronomers have been looking at the hundred or so very faint red splotches. Every point you can see on this image is, aren't stars, they're galaxies, and they're galaxies from just after the Big Bang. Now, what we believe we're seeing are the first objects to light up the universe, what we call reionization. We've been looking for these sources for a long time, and there are indications that these are really the first sources of light in the universe, and we're finally seeing them. So that's a long way away, but now let's come right back home, because something very interesting is going to happen in the early hours of October 28th, and that is an eclipse of the moon. When the moon passes into the shadow cast by the Earth and turns a dim, often coppery colour, so it comes out of the shadow again. It begins after about one o'clock GMT, and is total at half past two, and remains total for just over the hour. So do watch that if you can and take pictures of it. I can't say eclipses of the moon are important. In fact, they're not, but they're lovely to watch. And this is the last one for a couple of years, so let's make the most of it. Clouds permitting, it should be well seen from here. And now, on to our main programme, planets of other stars. Our sun is a very ordinary star. It has planets. Why shouldn't other stars have planets? We now know they have. At this stage, a welcome return to the sky at night for Professor Barry Jones, Professor of Astronomy at the Open University. Welcome back, Barry. Thank you very much. First of all, other planets. So what have we found and what are they like? Right, well, starting in 1995 with the discovery of the first planet beyond our solar system, which was around the star called 51 Pegasi, we've since discovered 117 planetary systems with 133 planets, which clearly means that there are several of them, 13 systems in fact, are, are multiple planet systems. These are mainly around stars, a bit like the Sun, because those are the stars that have attracted the most, the most attention. Now, an important thing about the planets that we've discovered is their masses. And what we've discovered is that we have mass ranging so far from something like the, the, the mass of, of Neptune, about 17 times the mass of the Earth, right up to the mass of Jupiter, which is, you know, 318 times the mass of the Earth or whatever, to several times uh, Jupiter's mass. So these are all giant planets, and ex the exception of the very low mass ones at the ne Neptune end, they're thought to be like Jupiter, composed mainly of hydrogen uh, and, and helium. The fascinating thing about these planets is that unlike our solar system, where Jupiter and Saturn and the giant planets are well out of the system, well out uh, in the external part of it, the Earth is at one AU, one astronomical unit, 
Jupiter's at five astronomical units. In the exoplanetary systems, we have giants all the way from sort of a few astronomical units right the way down to orbiting the star even closer than Mercury orbits the Sun. Well, that is surprising, is it not? I mean, a giant planet like Jupiter orbiting so close to its parent star, the temperature must be incredibly high. And how could a planet like that form in such a position? The temperature certainly is incredibly high, and um, uh, these planets are hot, uh, Jupiters as they call it, are actually losing a little bit of mass, evaporating off. Before we discovered any, any, any exoplanetary systems, we, we thought we understood how planets formed. Um, in our own uh, solar system, for example, we had, uh, we believe, the Sun formed in the middle, and around it was left this disk of, of, of debris, a little bit of dust, an awful lot of hydrogen and helium. The giant planets, it's thought, formed well out in the system, where it's cold and, yeah. and then these huge amounts of gas could actually collapse onto a core of some sort. The terrestrial planets then formed from the dust that was uh, prevalent in the uh, sort of central part of the system. That's what we thought. And then we discovered these blooming great Jupiter planets, you know, close to their star. And you can't form them there. Yeah. It, it, all the models show you just cannot condense these huge masses of gas it that close in. So they had to form further out and move in. There's no other uh, alternative. But how can that have happened? Well, the theory was pretty quick on the heels of the observations. And what people think now is that the giant planet forms, there's a remnant disk of, of gas mainly, the giant then creates a sort of spiral structure in this remnant disk. And this is then able to gravitationally interact, the spiral on the giant, such that the giant moves inwards and might even fall right into the star then why didn't that happen in our own solar system? Luckily for us, it didn't. Luckily for us, it didn't. But the reason is uh, you can tamper with the uh, structure of the disk. And if you make it of quite low density, then you find that the migration is very limited. We believe Jupiter did migrate a little bit, but there wasn't enough gas around there to, to make it go right in. Of course, a giant planet migrating in was like that would sweep up and destroy any small planets that were there. They would indeed. However, the, the latest models show that the Earth planets are rather slow at forming and that these giants can form, migrate right through, not so much Earths and Venuses and things, but migrate through debris that's on its way to forming Earths and Venuses. It scatters it, and lo and behold, it can actually form planets even though the giant has gone crashing through it, and you can get your terrestrial planets um, after migration. So they're certainly there, but uh, so far we haven't actually seen a planet of another star. So. How do we detect them? Well, so far, we are only detecting them indirectly. And the most, um, I'll show you with this model, the most productive technique um, uh, is called Doppler spectroscopy. Oh, that yes. has discovered the great majority of, of, of the planetary yes. system so far. Now imagine that this is a star, it's a bright, luminous thing, which you can actually see yes. very easily. This is the planet, um, which you can't see, it's too dim. Um, but nevertheless, it has an effect because the star and the planet orbit around the common center of gravity of this system. So what happens is that as the star is receding from you, the spectral lines from the star's atmosphere are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And as the star is coming towards you, the spectral lines are shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. Therefore, your spectral line will oscillate, wobble to and fro around the mean point. That's correct. As the orbit, uh, as the star goes around its orbit, you get this shifting to and fro of the spectral lines, yes. Now, we know the Doppler system definitely works. That's well established. But there are other methods of detecting extrasolar planets. What about the, the transits? Right. Well, there are several other methods, but the one that looks as if it's going to be very productive in, in, in the near future is the transit method. And in that, um, you've got to be a bit lucky because you've got to be seeing the orbit of the planet absolutely edgewise. So what happens then is that you've got the star here, the planet's going around it, and it gets between you and the star. And so the planet causes a dip in the light that you're getting from the star. And, and this dip is, is very readily measured. Well, we had a transit of Venus uh, a few months ago. We mm. did a sky at night about it. Would, would that have been detectable from uh, afar? No, at the moment we don't have the technology to detect transits of, of terrestrial-sized bodies like, like Venus. But Jupiter? 
Jupiter, yes, we could certainly detect Jupiter and Saturn from quite a few light years away. So we do have the technology to detect um, a, a big range of planets. Well, the problem obviously is that uh, to detect these transits, you've got to monitor the star very carefully, and there uh, are a good many stars to do. Indeed. But there is a way around it. WASP, Wide Angle Search for Planets, or rather Super WASP. Mm. And the first instrument of this kind has been set up on the Canary Islands, and uh, Chris Lintos has been there. Here on the island of La Palma, 9,000 feet above sea level, is one of the world's best sites for astronomical observation. As you might expect, some of the world's leading telescopes are up here. The Liverpool telescope behind me is the world's largest robotic telescope. The William Herschel, with a four-metre mirror, is the UK's largest telescope. And up on the hill, we have the world's leading solar observatories. But one of the most exciting projects on the mountain is also one of the most low-tech, and its home is the shed just down behind me. Super Wasp, the wide angle search for planets, which began life not looking for planets but trying to take photos of a bright comet. The idea was born many, many years ago, over a decade ago actually, uh, when Don Paleco was working here as a support astronomer at the Isaac Newton Group of Telescopes. And he came up with the idea to build a wide field camera to look at a comet, at Comet Hayakutaki. Um, and he made a nice discovery with that, uh, with that camera, which was a very, um, a very inexpensive uh, project that he, that he uh, made. Um, and he discovered off the comet, he discover, on the comet, he discovered a, a sodium tail, which was novel. But not, not only that, it may also made him realize that all the stars in the same field as the comet, he could actually measure the intensity of those, star, that, those stars very, very accurately. And that made him think of other applications of a wide field camera system uh, such as he had built um, and it also brought him up to the idea to um, um, to measure planetary transits in the future with a system that was specially built for that and a system that we now know as super wasp and this is super wasp five separate lenses which cover between them cover huge areas of the sky and that information is fed back into cooled ccd cameras and then through the cables back into the computers in the control room behind us for a project like this, it's essential to cover huge areas of the sky very quickly. And one of the beauties of Super Wasp is that it does this with really very simple equipment. There's a lens and a camera. No telescope needed at all. Super Wasp is a collaboration between many British institutions. Dr. Stephen Kane from the collaboration is out here in La Palma to observe using the instrument. Each of the uh, cameras and lenses on this instrument has a field of view of 8 degrees by 8 degrees. Now if you remember the moon is only half a degree in diameter. So that means that we can look at the whole sky several times in one night. But at the moment we're only looking at a few particular fields all through the night. So when you're up here observing, do you control the system? How much interaction do you have with it? Well it's designed to be completely robotic. And at the moment what we can do is we can start the instrument observing at the beginning of, of the night and if there's any bad weather the dome closes itself and then if the weather improves it opens up again and continues observing. This is the control room for Super Wasp and uh, here we have on the screen one of the images that we took from last night and what happens with these images is they are written to tape here on this tape drive and these tapes are sent to various institutions within the Super Wasp consortium and then we uh, measure the brightness of the stars in each of those images. When a planet passes in front of a star, it temporarily reduces the brightness of the star. You can see that the uh, brightness drops down slightly and then goes back up again. So we're getting a few gigabytes of data per camera per night. Now, if you realise that there are five cameras on the instrument, then that adds up to a lot of data per year that we have to keep up with. And there's going to be more. I understand you're planning to expand Super Wasp in the future? Yes, we already have funding to place a second SuperWASP installation in the Southern Hemisphere. That will have five cameras as well, but eventually each of those instruments will have eight cameras each. The team are on the verge of the first extrasolar planet discoveries from SuperWASP, which will be the start of a new wave of discovery from a project that started by trying to photograph a comet. SuperWASP is indeed a fascinating project, and of course it is British. Let's hope it brings results. Well, Barry, so far, all the planets we found are hot Jupiters. What are the chances of finding planets like the Earth, where there might be life? I think they're pretty good. We've got all these new transit surveys now being set up, and they will have the sensitivity to detect Earth-sized planets going in front of the star. 
We've also got the, the, the Doppler spectroscopy method continuing, and with longer and longer periods of time that we're observing systems, we be able to dig out of the data the really small motions of the star which are produced by an Earth mass planet going around them. This is a few years off. It might happen tomorrow, but it's possibly a few years off. In the meantime, people like me and others are modeling these exoplanetary systems to see whether they could have Earths in the first place. It's not an awful lot of good looking at a planet if, uh, at a planetary system if, if, if you don't believe that it could possibly have Earths. You see, you've got this problem. Star. Giant. Going around the star. Now, there's a certain range of distances from the star called the Goldilocks zone, which is neither too hot nor too cold uh, for liquid water to exist on the surface of a planet. So that gives us a kind of habitable zone, as it's called. The Goldilocks zone is a habitable zone. In many of these systems, we've got the giant planet orbiting inside the habitable zone, but very, fairly close to it, or outside the habitable zone and fairly close to it. And it's not at all clear, if you put an Earth in there, that it will actually survive, or whether the gravity of the giant will just chuck it out, you know, and, and, you, and you've got no, no possibility of life. So what I've been doing with a couple of research students is, is modeling all these really uh, well-known systems up there with their giants to see whether Earths could actually survive for biologically useful lengths of time. What we discovered from our research is that about half of the exoplanetary systems up there, the real ones that we know about, could have an Earth in the habitable zone at the right distance from the, the star for life. Now, and that's right now, if you say, well, could this have happened at any time during the star's lifetime, then that proportion rises from a half to about two-thirds. So it looks very good for the potential for finding Earths up there. And I wonder what they'd be like. Well, we, we, we don't know. Um, of course, it's all very well to discover an Earth-sized uh, planet or an Earth-mass planet, but that tells you nothing about the nature of the planet itself. It'll be very intriguing uh, to discover that you have a planet orbiting in, in the habitable zone, but not knowing anything about its actual habitability. So we have to look to space missions that are coming in the next uh, 10 or so years, in particular Darwin, which is a European Space Agency mission planned for about 2015. This will be a space mission consisting of several uh, telescopes in, in space with the capability of actually seeing an Earth. It's only, you see, possible to tell anything about the planet, about its life-bearing capabilities, if you can actually see it as a dot of light. Its mass, its radius, doesn't tell you much about that. But if you can see an Earth in the habitable zone, you can then analyze the light that you're receiving from it to see whether it's a potentially habitable planet. And do you think this will be possible in the foreseeable future? I think by 2015 we should have, um, uh, well, spectra, in fact, of, of the planetary atmosphere. And if, for example, we were to discover oxygen in the planetary atmosphere, then this would lead us to the conclusion that not only was the planet, you know, possibly habitable, but much more importantly, that it is actually inhabited, and that would be a very exciting result. It would indeed, and I wonder if at this very moment somebody or something up there is looking at us and wondering, is there life here? One day I hope you'll find out, perhaps in our time. Barry, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's newsletter time, so if you want your newsletter, send your stamp just envelope to Sky at Night, newsletter number 95, BBC Birmingham, mailbox B1, 1RF. When I come back next month, I'll be talking about something quite different. What happens to a star at the end of its life? The death of a star. Until then, good night. And there's another chance to see the sky at night tomorrow evening at 8.30 over on BBC Four.